thank you for your applause and welcome to the Royal Society, but actually I'm just doing the housekeeping bit before we get going, so thank you. Um, um, and all, all I've got to say is please could you make sure that your phones are on silent. Uh, we have a hashtag if you want to tweet. Um, and just to say we haven't planned any fire drills or so on this evening, so um, if there is a, an alarm, it's real and you can um, calmly make your way back out the um, entrance that you came in and there's another exit here to my right, your left on the stage. That would be great. Thank you. And now we can do the real start. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the President of the Royal Society, Sir Venki Ramakrishnan. Good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to the 2016 Insight Investment Royal Society Book Prize. Um, this prize celebrates popular science writing and I have to say, uh, I have been influenced by science books uh, ever since I was a, a kid. And many of us have gone into science as a result of reading books about science. In fact, I just mentioned a few minutes ago that entire generations of people went into microbiology because of a famous book called The Microbe Hunters. And um, I myself were, was influenced by people uh, by books like The Double Helix, which got me into molecular biology. So this is uh, an integral part of our culture and has been for a long time. It's also important, regardless of whether you go into science or, or not, because science uh, permeates all aspects of our lives. It's part of our world. It's part of, it tells us about the universe around us. And so uh, really it's one of the most uh, important things uh, that uh, is done in science, which is to communicate science um, to uh, the general population. Now, the prize was originally established in 1988, so it has a fairly long history, uh, but it's currently supported by Inside Investment, and we're very grateful uh, to them for their support. And over the years, it's grown into one of the UK's most prestigious uh, non-fiction literary prizes. Uh, I know that I, since I moved to the UK, have bought several books uh, after it, they've been shortlisted and, and uh, displayed in the sort of window of heifers. And I look at it and it looks interesting and I go off and buy it. And so it, it does serve a, a very useful role. And uh, I know that, you know, in some sense, writing books is not a competition. It's not like running the 100 meter dash where you have, you know, the first three winners and so on. And so in a sense, you know, having a, a book prize uh, which implies a kind of competition may be sort of counter to that. But the reality is that it does raise the profile for all science writing as a whole. And even uh, books that were on the long list or other books which didn't make it to the long list benefit indirectly by the publicity given uh, to science writing as a result of the prize. And so it's a, I, I think it's a worthy en uh, endeavor. Now, the prize is, celebrates books that make science more accessible, but also books that are a pleasure to read, that are enlightening, creative, and stimulating. And this year's uh, shortlist nominees are, cover a wide variety uh, of uh, different areas. One is about a kind of conformism in science that led to the search for a planet that actually doesn't exist, but people simply bought the idea that it existed on, on the basis of some data and you know, spent uh, years sort of trying to find it. Another is uh, about uh, what we might do uh, for climate change. In other words, what sort of steps are we prepared to take, including some fairly drastic steps that uh, could actually alter our climate in the reverse direction. You know, what are the pros and cons of this? You know, very topical and tells us about uh, the power of technology and how we think about the earth as a system. Another one is about the science of mind over matters. I mean, as the 
president of the Royal Society and as a scientist generally, I've often spoken out against things like homeopathy and astrology. Now, we all know that things do work for a reason and that's why uh, we have a well-known effect called the placebo effect. And I often tell people that it'd be interesting to study why we have the placebo effect. And you know, uh, this is a book that talks about that link between our mind and, and our physiology. And uh, so again, very wide, widely interesting uh, kind of book. We have a book about a very commonplace object that many of us take for granted, but it's only when we think about it that we realize uh, how amazing it is and how much we really don't know about it, and that's bird's eggs, which come in such a variety of forms, have a such, such different times from you know, hatching to, you know, from laying to hatching and so on. And another book is about uh, a grand tour of genetics. We all talk about our genes. Very few of us have actually thought about what is a gene and what does it do? And how do genes interplay, uh, you know, in our body to sort of develop? It's not just something we inherit. Genes not only transmit information from generation, but they also help, they're also builders. The, the, it's genes that are responsible for a single cell to develop into an entire animal. So we have a book about that. And finally, uh, an interesting aspect of science is to learn about scientists. Uh, often, you know, we know about famous scientists. We know about Newton, Einstein, and so on. But there are other scientists who've had incredibly interesting lives who've had tremendous impact on the science of their day. And so we have uh, a biography. Uh, so that's the range of books that uh, are shortlisted today, and you'll be hearing more about them uh, later. Now, the, this sort of thing couldn't be possible without the, you know, time, you know, without the incredible effort and the time uh, involved in it that's been donated by the judges. And they've actually uh, read a large number of books in, in order to even arrive at the shortlist and then have had to uh, have the difficult task of choosing uh, from that shortlist. So um, I would like them to stand up, if you don't mind. I know one of them, you know, Midwesterners are not known for their sort of self-promotion, but nevertheless, as, as someone who's married to one, I'm going to have to ask uh, one of them to stand up. So I'm going to ask the judges to stand up. So uh, Bill Bryson has chaired the committee. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Anyone needs to the next one is Dr. Claire Burridge. And then someone who goes by a pseudonym, Girl Scientist. <laughs> Roger Highfield. And finally, Alistair Reynolds. So thank you all for your hard work and uh, for your dedication to this task and, and the difficult job of choosing the winner. So I'd like to now hand over to Brian Cox, who's going to tell you uh, a bit more and then introduce the writers. Good evening. It's, um, it's my job to, uh, I suppose, keep the evening flowing and on time and introduce you to the authors. So the, the format is that each author is going to give a reading, a short reading from their book, and then we're going to have a, a discussion session for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I should say that my, um, one of my jobs is the Professor of Public Engagement here at the Royal Society, um, and I wanted to echo uh, what Venki said about the, the importance of science books. I think um, Carl Sagan in his book The Demon Haunted World made a very powerful point which is that in a democracy such as ours uh, where citizens live in a society that is dominated by science um, it is essential that as many citizens as possible have a, 
a, a reasonable working understanding of what science is, not necessarily knowing facts about the age of the universe or the details of evolutionary biology, but knowing how to weight scientific advice, scientific evidence. And I think, I, I, think, I believe very strongly that the best door to really teach science is through books. I think that television and radio, and the, the, the things that I spend quite a lot of time doing are a good a tool for inspiration. But to start to dig deeper, the longer form of a book, I think is absolutely essential. So with that, um, let me begin to introduce the authors. Um, I'll invite them up uh, one at a time. And the first uh, will be uh, Tim Burkhead. So the first book is The Most Perfect Thing, Inside and Outside a, bir a Bird's Egg. Uh, Tim's a professor at the University of Sheffield, where he teaches animal behavior and the history of science. Now he's written for The Independent, New Scientist, and BBC Wildlife, and has several award-winning books already, including Bird Sense and the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Birds. So please welcome on stage, Tim. book has had a long incubation, but was, spun in <laughs> but was spun into life by a chance encounter. I was watching a wildlife program on television one evening in 2012 when, when a well-known presenter appeared beside a cabinet of eggs in a museum. Opening one of the drawers, he took out an egg. It was white, I remember. I also remember he held it up to the camera to demonstrate its size and unusual pointed shape. This is a guillemot's egg, he announced. And the reason, he said, for this extraordinary shape is so that it will spin on its axis and not roll off the narrow ledge on which guillemots breed. To demonstrate, he placed the egg on a surface of the cabinet and spun it, and sure enough, the egg rotated on the spot like a horizontal top. I couldn't believe what I'd just seen. Not because it was amazing, because I was a, but because I was aghast that somebody so revered for his natural history knowledge should make such a mistake. The spinning on the, stop story, spinning on the spot story for guillemot eggs was debunked over a century ago, and here it was being given new life to an audience of millions. You can spill a spin a guillemot egg on its long axis, especially if, like the television presenter, you're using a blown, that is, an empty museum egg. But that's not how a real egg full of yolk and albumin and a developing embryo operates. When I wrote to the presenter, pointing out that what he just told us was wrong, his initial un response was understandably grumpy. I offered to send him the scientific papers on the topic so he could read the relevant research for himself. And I was about to post them when I had a sudden crisis of confidence. Here I was telling a television star how to behave when I could be wrong myself. I decided to reread the papers. I've studied guillemots continuously for the last 40 years in Scotland, England, uh, and in the Arctic. I've lived and breathed guillemots for 40 years, and I've read pretty well everything that's been written about them. But I last looked at those articles dealing with guillemot egg shape about 20 years previously, which is why I suddenly questioned my memory and decided to reread them. It's just as well I did, for the data and conclusions were both opaque and much messier than I remembered. I decided to reinvestigate. All this was, although this was an old problem, re-entering the world of the guillemot egg was like exploring a new world and with paths leading in all sorts of new directions in what has since been an absolutely exhilarating journey. At one level, it sounds trivial. Who cares why guillemots lay pointed eggs? But at another, it was, a, it was wonderful, encompassing everything that science is supposed to be. And I say that with due modesty. Much of science has been distorted by government-imposed assessment exercises that result in short-term, financially motivated studies whose results are often overstated and occasionally even falsified. My egg project has an air of adventure about it, and to my mind, that's what science should be, an adventure. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. 
Now, the next book is The Hunt for Vulcan, How Albert Einstein Destroyed a Planet and Deciphered the Universe by Thomas Levinson. Now, Thomas is a professor at MIT and the author of the best-selling Newton and the Counterfeiter. His other books include Einstein in Berlin and Ice Time, Climate, Science and Life on Earth. So please welcome Thomas. when this is all done? It's lovely. This is the first time any of us have seen these, I believe. All right. 3, 16, 24, point 2 p.m. Third contact. Totality ends. When the moon's disk slides past the face of the sun, the world jumps. It feels unfair, as if one's been granted a moment's glimpse of an utterly different reality, that rectangle of Narnian forest through the open doors of a wardrobe or a sudden vision of the train on platform nine and three quarters. Then a crescent of sunlight appears, and the normal, increasingly daylit world returns. The corona switches off, and any stars that had appeared during totality fade. As sunlight returned to the high plain by separation, Wyoming, Watson ran out of time. He hadn't managed to find any landmark stars for B. Now, in a Hail Mary bid to get at least a hint of replication, he ran over to Newcomb, quote, in the hopes that he might, before the sunlight became too bright, get a place of that strange star I had first observed, A, near Theta Cancri. Newcomb couldn't. He was still making sure of the position of the object he'd found on his last wide sweep of the sun. Watson dashed back to his own instrument. No good. He could no longer make out either, his, um, either of his candidate objects. Newcomb later confirmed that his candidate was just a familiar star, adding, quote, it is, of course, now a matter of great regret that I did not let my own object go and point on Professor Watson's. Watson did not seem to mind. Even without Newcomb, he had no doubt about A. Quote, in the case of the star observed near Delta Cancri, I was sure, and the discovery was accordingly announced by telegraph. Or, as the Laramie Weekly Sentinel put it, with some added exuberance, Professor Watson of Ann Arbor, Michigan, had taken the job of finding Vulcan. It's all caps, by the way. Uh, and then, on a historic Wyoming afternoon, quote, he found it. Paper adding, it has come to be well understood among astronomers that Watson has a corner on the discovery of comets, asteroids, planets, etc. Vulcan. Two decades after Le Verrier had, for the second time, conjured a, conjured a planet at his desk, there it was a small, ruddy object, moderately bright, orbiting the sun undeniably inside the orbit of Mercury. Thank you. Well, the next book is Cure, A Journey into the Science of Mind Over Body by Jo Merchant. Now, jo is an award-winning science journalist based in London. She's worked as an editor, a new scientist, and at Nature, and her articles have appeared in publications including The Guardian, Wired, The Observer, New Scientist, and Nature. Her book, Decoding the Heavens, was shortlisted for the 2009 Ross Society Prize. Please welcome Jo. this book with an intellectual curiosity. I wanted to know how the mind affects the body and in, to investigate that in a, an evidence-based way. But in, in doing that, this book took me to a lot of places uh, geographically and emotionally that I never could have imagined when I started. So this reading is about one of those places. We wheel her in on a gurney. She's in her 90s, perhaps, with pale, squashy flesh and gnarled hands and feet, her face all thread veins and no teeth. The bed nearly fills the square cubicle. Behind her is the blue and white striped curtain she entered through, on either side, the tiled walls are lined with plastic chairs and hooks. Ahead, past her feet, is another curtain. She's shaking as we undress her, 
unbuttoning her blouse to reveal a voluminous tummy. Ne vous inquiétez pas, madame, a squat Spanish lady instructs her. Don't worry. Soon she's naked except for an enormous nappy. Two of us stand on each side, working together, our moves choreographed and rehearsed. We roll her one way and then the other as we slide a sheet underneath her hefty body. We place a blue blanket over her, lift her up on the sheet to slide a stretcher underneath, then we whisk the blanket away and over goes another sheet like a tablecloth, except that this one is cold and wet. It takes seven of us, three on each side plus one at the head, to carry the stretcher, feet first, past the inner curtain and into a second chamber. It's a small, austere space, lined with grey stone. Square, but high, with a high, curved ceiling, it gives the impression of a miniature chapel. The floor is tiled, wet and treacherous, and in the middle is a rectangular stone trough, filled to knee height with cold, blue-tinged water. A small, blue and white statue stands at the far end, the Virgin Mary. We shuffle down a couple of steps until the woman's stretcher is over the water, head resting on the top step, and we count together, un, deux, trois, and plunge her into the water. I've been doing this all day, dipping woman after woman into these icy baths. This little space is the last of a row of ten or so similar curtain-lined cubicles, each with its own team led by a madame. We're all unpaid volunteers, and it's unlike any job I've done before. We start each shift with 20 minutes or so of singing and prayer, voices sailing up above the cubicle walls. Then the women come in. There are separate baths for men and one for children. They've been queuing for hours for this moment, and they've travelled from around the world, just as the volunteers have. They're American, Italian, Indian, Irish, young, old, well, sick. They're all here in the belief that these waters have healing powers. This is Lourdes. Thank you. The next book is The Planet Remade, How Geoengineering Could Change the World by Oliver Morton. Uh, Oliver is briefings editor of The Economist, uh, having formerly been Chief News Editor of Nature and Editor-in-Chief of Wired. He's the author of Mapping Mars, Science, Imagination and the Birth of a World, and Eating the Sun, How Light Powers the Planet, and has written for many publications over his career. So please welcome Oliver. Doesn't that look nice? <laughs> yes, that would, that, that would be a very nice way to do it. Um, I'm not going to read any of the science books. I'm going to read from almost the very end of this book, um, but it's not really much of a spoiler. A uh, little bit of a spoiler. There is a word missing from this book. It is we. In the places it crops up, it refers more or less explicitly to you, the readers, and me, the writer. It's mostly used to point either to what has been said before or to what will be said later. There's been a sort of community between us in the writing and reading, and within that space shared across time, we has seemed a fair word to use. What there is not is the unqualified we that crops up in so much writing about the climate and other topics, the we of surreptitious and spurious suasion, the we used to align the writer, the reader, and an ill-defined group of people who it is implied naturally agree, and which thus seems to include all right-thinking people, the we that says, we know what to do, we just have to do it. The we that supposes that my interests are your interests. And that the interests of people in different countries and with different views can be easily aligned. The we that seeks to speak for the world, a world that they are letting down. And you know what they are like, don't you? They are a dodgy bunch. They're not like us. The we that I've left out is the we who are told that we cannot let this go on blatantly ignoring the fact that we do. The we that seeks to speak for all people, all history, all species, as long as they agree with the author. It's almost impossible to speak on political subjects without invoking this we. It's quite hard to write without it, but I thought it was worth doing because that we is not an innocent illusion, it's a harmful one. The we that matters is not one summoned as a rhetorical tool by an author. It is one built by people who do the difficult work of actually agreeing with each other about what they need to agree on, and agreeing on their realm of disagreement, too. Making a we is hard, and it is essential. It is the essence of politics. It is the essence, too, of love. And as far as geoengineering goes, there is no we. 
There is no, we must try it, or we must not try it. There are arguments, and places to have them, some of which exist and some of which must be invented. There are movements which will come to speak, not for all, but for themselves. There may be a we at the end of the process, a we who decides. But here, at the beginning, before the beginning, there is not. The politics have yet to be done. So, for now, this is personal. I've been aware, writing this book, that my hopes for geoengineering and the meanings that I ascribe to it reflect feelings deeper than those I have about radiative forcing and the goings on above the tropopause. The feeling that things press in, that history and the world embroil the present in a way that confines choice ever tighter, that is, that is part of my temperament. The constant sense that if only there could be a bit more room, a bit less pressure, if only the envelope could be expanded, the boundaries pushed back, if only there were time and space to breathe, that is my confined, asphyxiated perception. It comes from experiences within my life, some of which I understand a bit, some of which I doubtless don't. It probably chimes with the experiences of some of you, too, in some way and to some degree. Who has room enough, time enough, choice enough? I'm less aware of where the hope comes from, the hope that things might indeed be different. But there is a hope. Thank you. The next book uh, is The Gene, An Intimate History by uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee. Now, unfortunately, Siddhartha couldn't join us uh, this evening in person, but we have a video of him, and uh, we'll play that now. Uh, Siddhartha is a, can is a cancer physician and researcher, a stem bi cell biologist, and a cancer geneticist. He's the author of The Lords of Medicine and The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer, which won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction and the Guardian First Book Award. garden. The monastery was originally a nunnery. The monks of St. Augustine's order had once lived, as they often liked to grouse, in more lavish circumstances, in the ample rooms of a large stone abbey on the top of a hill in the heart of the medieval city of Brunel. The city had grown around them over four centuries, cascading down the slopes and then sprawling out over the flat landscape of farms and meadowlands below. The friars had fallen out of favor with, the, with Emperor Joseph II in 1783. The midtown real estate was far too valuable to house them, the emperor had decreed, and the monks were packed off to a crumbling structure at the bottom of the hill in Old Brno. The halls had a vague animal smell of damp mortar and the grounds were overgrown with grass, bramble and weeds. The only perk of this 14th century building, as cold as a meat house and as bare as a prison, was a rectangular garden with shade trees, stone steps, and a long alley where the monks could walk and think in isolation. The friars made the best of the new accommodations. The library was restored on the second floor. The study room was connected to it and outfitted with pine reading desks, a few lamps, and a growing collection of nearly 10,000 books, including the latest works, natural history, geology, and astronomy. A wine cellar was carved out below, and one room cells with the most rudimentary wooden furniture housed the inhabitants on the second floor. In October 1843, a young man from Silesia, the son of two peasants, joined the abbey. He was a short man with a serious face, myopic and tending towards portliness. He professed little interest in the spiritual life, but he was intellectually curious, good with his hands, and a natural gardener. The monastery provided him with a home and a place to read and learn. He was ordained on August 6, 1847. His given name was Johann, but the friars changed it to Gregor Johann Mendel. For a young priest in training, life at the monastery soon settled into a predictable routine. In 1845, as part of his monastic education, 
Mendel attended classes in theology, history, and natural sciences at Brno's Theological College. The tumult of 1848, the bloody populist revolutions that swept fiercely through France, Denmark, Germany, and Australia, Austria, and overturned social, political, and religious orders largely passed him by like distant thunder. Nothing about Mendel's early years suggested even the faintest glimmer of the revolutionary scientist who would later emerge. <clears throat> Thank you. The last book tonight is The Invention of Nature, The Adventures of Alexander von Humboldt, The Lost Hero of Science by Andrea Wolfe. Now, Andrea is the author of several acclaimed books. She's written for many newspapers, including The Guardian, The LA Times, and The New York Times. She was the, the Eccles British Library Writer in Residence 2013 and a three-time fellow of the International Centre for Jefferson Studies in Monticello. So please welcome Andrea. <laughs> start at the beginning. They were crawling on hands and knees along a high narrow ridge that was in places only two inches wide. Down to the left was a steep cliff encrusted with ice that glinted when the sun broke through the thick clouds. The view to the right with a 1,000 foot drop wasn't much better. Here the dark almost perpendicular walls were covered with rocks that protruded like knife blades. Alexander von Humboldt and his three companions moved in single file slowly inching forward. Without proper equipment or appropriate clothes, this was a dangerous climb. The icy wind had numbed their hands and feet, melted snow had soaked their thin shoes, and ice crystals clung to their hair and beards. At 17,000 feet above sea level, they struggled to breathe in the thin air. As they proceeded, the jagged rocks shredded the soles of their shoes, and their feet began to bleed. It was the 23rd of June, 1802, and they were climbing Chimborazo, a beautiful dome-shaped inactive volcano in the Andes that rose to almost 21,000 feet, some 100 miles to the south of Quito in today's Ecuador. Chimborazo was then believed to be the highest mountain in the world. No wonder that their terrified porters had abandoned them at the snow line. As they climbed, Humboldt fumbled out his instruments with numb fingers, setting them upon precariously narrow ledges to measure altitude, gravity, and humidity. Sorry. At 18,000 feet, they saw a last scrap of lichen clinging to the boulder. After that, all sign of organic life disappeared. Even the condors that had accompanied their previous climbs were absent. As the fog whitewashed the air into an eerie, empty space, Humboldt felt com completely removed from the inhabited world. It was, he said, as if we were trapped inside an air balloon. Then, suddenly, the fog lifted, revealing Chimborazo's snow-capped summit against the blue sky. A magnificent sight was Humboldt's first thought. But then he saw the huge crevasse in front of them, 65 feet wide and about 600 feet deep. But there was no other way to the top. When Humboldt measured their altitude at 19,413 feet, he discovered that they were barely 1,000 feet below the peak. No one had ever come this high before. No one had ever breathed such thin air. As he stood at the top of the world, looking down upon the mountains and ranges folded below him, Humboldt began to see the world differently. He saw the earth as one great living organism where everything was connected conceiving a bold new vision of nature that still influences the way that we understand the natural world. Well, thank you. So I'd now like to invite all the authors to come up on stage, and we'll have a, we've got a while, actually. We've got about 15 minutes or so to chat about the book, so... So, 
I, I thought I'd start with, um, um, I suppose, the simplest and most obvious question, which is, um, which is why, why you wrote the books. I, I know, Tim, you, you kind of sort of answered that in a way with your reading, but I, I thought what was quite interesting is you, you, you said you, you, you'd been fascinated by this subject for a long time, but also there, there seemed to be a minor element of polemic there that you wanted to mention that this, this wonderful adventure of science is not only to be considered useful, but curiosity itself is a, is a, a I'm, in, I'm interested in how we know what we know about stuff. And I think that when you teach uh, undergraduates, telling them the story of how we found out about how we know stuff uh, really helps them become interested in and inspired. There were multiple reasons for writing this book. I mean, I've already uh, mentioned one of them, but another one was the fact that um, in today's world, children are increasingly dissociated from nature. And there's a kind of curious irony in that the RSPB has persuaded us that collecting eggs is a bad thing to do, even though people like David Attenborough and so on collected eggs when they, he was a boy. Um, and that, it's that dissociation that I wanted to challenge. You know, in, in a, lo a lot of people's minds today, it's inappropriate to to think about eggs. Of course, it's inappropriate to collect eggs, but it's also inappropriate to even talk about them, think about them. And I wanted to challenge that. Eggs are just the remote, most remarkable kind of testament to the success of natural selection. And so by advertising how wonderful and how beautiful eggs were, I tried to challenge that view. Um, Tom? I write books because something bugs me, and it just sort of bugs me over time. And eventually, it becomes easier to write the book than keep on being troubled by this thing. And I, my third book, published years and years ago, was about Albert Einstein. And um, when he was in the last stages of discovering, of working on general relativity, uh, one of the last things he does before he comes up with the, the final correct form of the, the, the equations of gravitation is he c uses his almost complete theory to calculate the orbit of Mercury. And he finds that his calculation, based on this theory, agrees with the uh, astronomer's data. And then he writes these letters to friends and says, you know, I had you know, palpitations. His heart leapt in his chest. This is, you know, he, he, apocryphally, he stopped work for a couple of days. And if you know anything about Einstein, it's that he's not that kind of guy. You know, he's not overly emotional. He never stops working. And so that fact, I didn't have, you know, it wasn't a big deal in the book, in that book, but it bugged me. And I started pulling on the threads. And what was it about this, this calculation? What made him so happy? And then I found that there was this extraordinary story that wasn't just about a discovery that, you know, a, a, a nice result in, 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 in astronomy and in, 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 the, in the history of the solar system. Um, it really I th spoke to me as, as a way of getting at how science works as a day-to-day -day experience. What happens when you get things wrong as well as when you, you know, the stuff we all hear about and write about when you get things right. Uh, just, wait, just to follow up, because Einstein is, I suppose, the, the is in some ways the, the easiest and most difficult scientist to write, but he's really the most iconic scientist. I mean, do, do you, the, the public perception of him as an, as an absolute genius, standing head and shoulders above everybody else, is kind of it's yeah. widespread. Mm -hmm. but could you comment briefly on that? Well, I mean, one of the great things about writing books, as you were discussing, is you get to do more than just flash the icons on the screen. And you know, Einstein was indeed a genius about some things, and very clever about other things, and an imbecile about you know, some other stuff, especially human relations. Um, and you know, my awe at his capacity to do physics uh, and my great respect for his moral sensibilities and lots of things is not diminished by learning the rest of the stuff. Um, and I think if you're writing about science for the public, one of the jobs is to remember that the great geniuses are geniuses in their domain, but they're human beings, and this is a human activity. Um, and it's really a mistake to make icons out of even an Albert Einstein. Though I did think about going up sockless in his honor for this evening. <laughs> but you didn't. I, I yeah. didn't. I, 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 I lack the courage of my convictions. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so, for you, why, why uh, what inspired you? 
I, I suppose I was just fascinated by the fact that the question of whether the mind can heal the body is so divisive. We have very extreme claims often made on one side that aren't really supported by scientific evidence for the healing power of the mind. And then on the other side, you have really die-hard skeptics who would say that any suggestion of the mind influencing the body was dangerous quackery. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, neither of those extremes really made sense to me. I, it seemed to me that both of those are based on the idea of the mind as some mysterious magical power that can't really be studied scientifically. So the believers conclude that therefore the mind can do anything and the skeptics conclude, well, therefore it can possibly do anything. And I was just really interested to take a, a, a more scientific approach, really, and look at well, what research is there, what can the mind do, what can't it do, how does it work, how could we perhaps use that in, in medicine. Um, so that was one aspect. And then the, the other aspect was just that I always like scientific topics um, that intersect with a lot of other areas of, of life. So when you're talking about the relationship between the mind and the body, there's a philosophical aspect to that. There's sort of social and cultural aspects, there's political and economic aspects. So, and also the, the human stories, firstly, of the, the researchers, a lot of whom have really risked their reputations even to study this area and obviously patients and people who've been in clinical trials who've been affected by some of this research. So, so I guess all of those things together made me feel like it was a, a good topic to, to look at. When, when you write about a subject that I suppose people feel very strongly, as you said, on, on either side, and then there's the, the people in the middle, do you dread reading the comments on Amazon or somewhere like that? <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few one star, yeah. Um, I was nervous um, about how it would be received, and I felt much more defensive about the, the need to be rigorous with the research, I suppose, than with my other books. I felt that I had to get this right because otherwise it was going to get jumped on. So there's a really long section of references at the back. Um, but actually, when the book came out, in terms of the reception, it's, it's been great. Actually, it was a kind of um, relief. You know, even, even Nature and New Scientist gave it very nice reviews. So yeah. I was, <laughs> hopefully I did that bit all right. Okay. And... Uh, so, Andrea, um, the book about this, uh, we, we were talking earlier, actually, because I I'd heard of von Humboldt because I did my PhD in Germany, and there, it's, we just discussed, it seems to be well-known, although he said confused with his brother. Uh, but here... Yeah, so, so, so he's the last of the polymaths. He dies in 1859, and I've, all my books have to kind of broadly deal with the relationship between humans and nature and he popped up in every single book and um, whenever I and I'm German so I knew him so but when I would talk to people about this great amazing scientist the most common reaction I got in the English speaking world was like a blank face like who never heard of him and then I'd go and say like, Humboldt current maybe and then you know some people would remember so I thought um, I would really like to write about him because he is he was the most famous scientist of his age, and he's so forgotten. And I think because he is so interdisciplinary, and he sees nature as a global force, and he, he, he talked about harmful human-induced climate change in 1800. He's the forgotten father of environmentalism. He says that the arts and the sciences should not be separated. So it just seemed all so incredibly relevant that he sh you know, maybe there was another lease of life in this life. Mm. And, and, and as you, so as you say, it's, it's not only a, a history a look back at this figure, um, but also has a message that's current, you think, of it. so there's an element of, uh, yes. what would you say, polemic? I suppose. Well, an argument. Argument. <laughs> I don't know. So for, for, the weird thing is that, so for me, it was never actually a biography of Humboldt. It was always a biography of an idea. That's why it's called the invention of nature. I really wanted to understand why we understand nature the way we do it. So I look at him, but I also look at eight people he influenced. And then moving from there, seeing, yes, he might have been forgotten, but his ideas have been carried on through other people, and they're still here. And it's almost as if his ideas are so self-evident that we've forgotten the man behind them, but they're very much around us. And um, Oliver, so you short answer is that my, uh, we were sitting in a, around a desk uh, in the nature offices um, almost 10 years ago, and, my dear colleague, and I was talking with my dear colleague Alexander Witsi about who should write various um, articles that we knew we had to write. 
and we came to the geoengineering one, and she said, well, you should write that. And I said, okay. And it turned out to be fascinating. <coughs> so that's the, but the, 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 the rich art of it, I guess, is that um, I always find my other books are all, all about the similarity and the distinction we can draw between what we think about as a planet and what we think about as a world. I mean, what we imagine and live in as a world and what we, uh, to some extent, abstract out as a planet. And at the moment, what we're doing to our world and our planet are intermingled processes. And I think that's an important thing to bring out. One of the things that I found as I was writing about geoengineering was it brings out so much else that I think is worth talking about in how humans relate to the climate, how humans relate to the planet, how humans relate to nature, that I found that it was, it was, it was like very rich in that way. And I, I'd hoped for that going in, but that's what I, what, what, what I found come through. The other thing was I do think that it's a serious part of the climate debate that's sort of like undercovered. Um, people don't talk about it as much as they would like. So I thought, well, I'll do some of that then. And, and you, you suggested that the, the small piece that you read was, you suggested that the, this search for a, well, if I interpret you correctly, that the search for a consensus is important and not yet present. So it's yeah. a political debate as well as a scientific debate that I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strand I try to get to in the book, which is, you know, climate change is... You know, as Douglas Allen is big, it's, it, no, it's really big. It's big like space is big. It's big like thousands of years. It's big like everybody. It's big like the whole planet. Um, and the idea that in the very short time in which we've consciously talked about international climate politics, so basically 1988 to kind of now, we've said everything that needs to be said and all that needs to be done now is just implement what we've already agreed and there's nothing else to be said ignores the way that people, people in Humboldt's time and people as far removed from us in the future as we are from Humboldt might think about this. There's a much broader discussion to be had, and that's something that I wanted to open up. I think, actually, although I want to carry this on, I think we've run out of time for the discussion there, so we've had one question. Let me just check whether we've got any more time. <laughs> no, we've, we've got about two minutes left. So, so uh, perhaps, perhaps if we could be very brief, I'd like everyone to go to uh, we, we, but. but Venki talks about the importance of science books. So, so if, if there's a, a sort of two-sentence summary about how important you feel it is for, for books about science to be written and to be read. It's absolutely important. I teach a course in history and philosophy of science uh, to final year undergraduates, and uh, the whole point is to make them read books. It's totally alien to them, most of them, <laughs> uh, but they have to read them to do the course. <laughs> I, I, I teach first year's physics, I agree, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you read a textbook? <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> well, I second that. Um, but I think the most important thing about books and the reason, science books, and the reason that they need to be supported by this kind of prize and a much bigger infrastructure than, than actually exists is that um, s science is a way of science as it's taught in school is often a body of results or a series of specific methods. It's actually a systematic way of thinking about your surroundings. Um, and you can instantiate that in books in a way you can't really in any other medium. And I think that's very important and crucial. Um, I mean, I think it goes without saying that science is absolutely crucial in every area of our life, you know, health, environment, politics. Um, so it, science books are important because of that, but I think books particularly are important because they allow you to um, talk about the science but explore it in relation to all of those other aspects. You have that space, and you have the space for the human stories that allow the readers to connect emotionally with that science, and I just think that is so important if they're going to engage with those topics. I'm going to give you um, an example from me. So I was really, really bad at science at school. I mean, like, I just hated it. And I fell in love with the history of science through books. So um, I think there are, you know, there are different people think differently about the world. And if you just do it through formulas and numbers, it doesn't work for some people. And, but books, stories work for other people, like for people like me. It actually just raises, uh, I'm, I'm going to follow up a question, which I'm going to do with everybody, who's very quick to answer. But as soon as you mentioned it, what, what is, if you could, what's your favorite? science book that you've read? What would you recommend to the audience, other than your own? 
Um, you can think about it if you want. If you... No, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, okay. It's a, col it's a library of, of books. Course, it's not, of it's, it can't be one. It's like saying what's your favourite album, isn't it? Yeah. It's impossible. Um, anyway. Look, am I doing the impossible one? No, 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 you can do that. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm all for science books, um, but I also want to bring out the importance to me, and I think to a lot of other people, also of science fiction books, which are a very important, not an introduction, but an ongoing inspiration. So. You talk, I talk to scientists who I find frequently big influence on them was reading Dune um, or reading the Foundation Trilogy um, or reading 2001 or seeing 2001. So I think that science books try to integrate science into a broader literary culture, but so does science fiction at its best and it possibly does so as powerfully. Yeah, I must say I agree with that. Childhood's End as well, Arthur C. Clarke was mm -hmm. one of those. That I couldn't tell the difference when I was younger between science and science fiction books. Uh, it's just all part of the I same inspiration. I, I, I think the closest definition of what I do is that I write non-fiction science fiction. I feel, feel I do that more than I write science books. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone want to contribute to that? If, if, there's, if there is one, one book, you would say... Uh, Darwin's uh, Voyage of the Beagle. It's fabulously readable. Mm. I, um, I mean, there is no one book, and I'm certainly not going to name a, a recent or contemporary one because that would be invidious, but a book that really integrates... Um, science and much else besides is uh, that I go back to often is Rose's uh, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, which is a wonderful history of uh, atomic physics and an incredibly important way of looking at much of 20th century history. And for science fiction, got to give a prop to my old MIT colleague, Joe Haldeman, and The Forever War. Not as well known as some of the others from the golden age of science fiction, but general relativity in the Vietnam War. Can't do better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit because there are just so many, but yeah, though um, just one was the, so yeah, it's an anthology. The Faber Book of Science Writing is just one that I remember reading as a, a student, um, and it had pieces of science writing from across the centuries, and it was just one that really switched me on to the power of science writing mm -hmm. earlier. I should say, actually, there's the, one that the great, the, the Ross Society uh, book edited by Bill Bryson, actually. Seeing Further, it's called, isn't it, the 2010? That's a great book. I would recommend to everyone as well. <laughs> 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 uh, did you think of one yet? Oh, you don't want to, you I, still know, I thought you I got know. out of this one. You <laughs> did, yeah. <laughs> but if, well, then, if you chose uh, The Voyage of the Beagle, I'm going to choose uh, um, Humboldt's personal narrative. Uh, very good. Um, oh, okay. I would say, for not, I, I would say, for me, it was uh, Freeman Dyson's Disturbing the Universe. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you all. It is now time for the announcement of the, uh, the winner of the prize. So um, if you'd all like to go and take your seats down off the stage again. Thank you very much. Everybody. <laughs> and, and I would like to welcome on stage... Uh, David Chellu from uh, Insight Investment, the prize's sponsor, and uh, Savenki, again, president of the Royal Society, to announce the winner. Can I start by saying what a wonderful honour it is to have the opportunity to support this prize? It really is a fabulous thing, um, and we're very pleased to be involved. Um, I have a couple of thank yous to make. One is to the Royal Society for accepting us as sponsor for this important prize. It is a choice, and we need to recognise that um, we're, we're glad that you, um, you chose us. Um, so very great thanks for that. We're very, very happy to be involved with this competition. The second one is to my home team at Insight Investment, who turned up in numbers tonight to support the prize. So thanks to everyone for coming in this, our first year of this new sponsorship. We actually had um, Brian present at our client summit back in March, um, and he was talking about the absence of absolute truths in the universe. It was a fantastic presentation and really got the audience of managers of pension schemes going <laughs> in a way that I've not seen them get going before. It's the first time that I've ever seen the chief investment officers of pension schemes queuing for autographs and selfies after one of our conference speakers. <laughs> Believe it or not, you don't find that every day I in the pension fund industry. Fine. You did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also remember it took you about three hours to get away that evening on your birthday as well, so it was a, an interesting evening. Um, firstly, the, uh, the main thing I'd like to do is pledge that we will be a responsible um, sponsor for this prize, 
now and in the years to come. Um, everyone at Insight cares about everything that happens at Insight, and now this sponsorship is part of that. Um, we'll make sure that we help um, grow the competition, and obviously we have a track record in doing that with our other sponsorships. I've got three points to make on why we chose to get involved with this prize. And this in our first year, it probably makes sense for us to, to cover this ground. Um, the first was, when we're looking at institutions to partner with, obviously there are thousands of options. And what I'm looking for is a combination of a philosophy and a purpose that is similar to our own as an investment organization. And when I saw um, the motto of not taking anyone's word for the truth um, and proving everything through experiment, that resonated with me. And the symbolism of the fact that most knowledge that society has to gain has yet to be discovered, again, resonated with the way um, we invest in the way we think of it as, a, as an institution. Uncertainty dominates the investment industry. Forecasting doesn't work. The thing we can do for our clients is invest precisely for them and increase their resilience in, in the face of the unknown. And that's what we decide to do. So that's why there's, it's important to make a link between the two organisations. The second one is really a cultural point, and it's what the authors go through when they're thinking about putting pen to paper. I like to recognise the idea that to put your ideas out to others and have them judged not just by your friends and stakeholders, but actually a much wider community who may disagree with you and maybe give you a hard time, it takes an awful lot of courage to overcome that, especially if you don't know that your book is ever going to get published um, at the time that you're writing it. And I think it's something to be applauded. Um, in fact, we might as well applaud it. <laughs> it's a truly wonderful thing, and we want people in our own organisation to be able to stand up and express their ideas and challenge the conventional wisdom in our own organisation to make us better, to make sure that we can continue to lead in our industry in the future. So there's a cultural parallel there that's really important for us. And the first one is almost a romantic idea, which is the idea that the knowledge that's imparted in books has a perseverance and a longevity that basically transcends generations. And I love that idea that basically someone at some point in the future, maybe decades down the line, will be inspired by one of the books you've written. And that will change the course of their lives and encourage them into careers in science, mathematics, and technology, and other, other STEM-related subjects. And at uh, Insight, we're, we're very keen. In fact, we're over the moon to be supporting anything that promotes maths and science education in schools to young people. So that's the, me explaining briefly the reason for our involvement in this competition. I hope that makes sense. Now we get on to the main event tonight, which is um, the announcement of tonight's winner. So please, wel please join me in welcoming the President of the Royal Society to make the award. Thank so thank you again to Insight for sponsoring this uh, award, which is, uh, I think, is one of the most important things that we do at the Royal Society, because it really is, is a way to connect science with the broader uh, public. We've heard a lot of reasons why uh, these books are important. We've heard from the authors. Uh, so I won't belabor the point, except to say uh, what a wonderful range of topics uh, science covers. And it's really something that we as human beings should be as proud of as anything else we've done, like music or art, um, you know, literature. Uh, it's really a, a triumph of human achievement, how we've come to know what we know now uh, about the world around us and about ourselves. So I really... Uh, I want to sort of thank everybody and especially to thank uh, the writers uh, for, for spending that time to put down their ideas and communicate uh, their thoughts with the rest of us. So this is going to be as much of a surprise to me as uh, to all of you. So um, the winner is Andrea Wolf. <laughs> Thank you.
you. Um, we were asked to um, say a few words, so I'm just going to do this very quickly. Um, it's such a great honor to win the Royal Society Science Prize, um, in particular because I've spent many days of great research at the Royal Society for all my books. And of course, Alexander von Humboldt was a fellow here at the Royal Society. Whenever he was in London, he came to the Thursday meetings um, to meet like-minded scientists. Um, sometimes he was invited to the even more exclusive Royal Society Dining Club. Um, but he was very much used to the Parisian cuisine, and he was not impressed by the food <laughs> here. In fact, he wrote to a friend in Paris, I dined at the Royal Society where one gets poisoned. <laughs> so that definitely has gotten much better. I had lots of delicious lunches here in the canteen. Um, but I would like to thank the judges for choosing the invention of nature and for choosing Humboldt and everybody at John Murray, in particular Georgina Laycock and Nick Davis, who believed in this book right from the beginning. And a huge, huge thank you to my fabulous agent and friend, Patrick Walsh, who worked so hard on this book, and without whom I would have never written this. And to Julia Zen, who's not here, but he, she came with me to South America and followed Humboldt's footsteps. And instead of co drinking cocktails and enjoying beaches, she suffered altitude sickness and um, battled tarantulas. And, um, <laughs> The Invention of Nature is dedicated to my daughter, my very fabulous, amazing grown-up daughter, Linnea, who knows why it's dedicated to her, so thank you. And uh, last but not least, a huge thank you to Mr. Alexander von Humboldt, who um, has been the greatest companion for the past few years. So I hope he's somewhere out, here, out there in his cosmos raising a glass. Thank you. It just remains for me to, to thank everyone who's been involved with the prize, in particular Insight Investment and, and the Royal Society for running what is a, I, I think, I'm sure we all agree, an extremely important prize. Also thank you to the, the judges and to the authors. And uh, finally, let me offer my congratulations to, uh, to Andrea. Um, it's a, I look forward to reading the book. It's, it's the biggest <laughs> book as well, isn't it? Number one. So, uh, so thank you all. Um, and uh, well, We'd like to make your way out. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Thank you.